You're watching Tim Topham TV, the piano teaching podcast. This is episode number 45. G'day everyone and welcome to today's episode of the Piano Teaching Podcast with me, Tim Topham. Thank you very much for tuning in wherever you are around the world and whatever you're doing, um, I really appreciate that you've decided to stick my voice in your ears and hopefully get some very cool and inspirational ideas for your teaching for the coming few weeks. Today's episode is an absolute ripper. I can't wait to share this one with you because my guest today, Vashti Somerville, is basically one of the coolest people I've ever met. And she not only is just doing a normal interview today, but she went to the trouble of getting her students along and she's actually gonna demonstrate and give us a walkthrough tour of her studio, which is really important because today this topic is all about using ORF to teach rhythm. Now, if you're not sure what ORF is all about, you're obviously going to find out. Uh, but basically, it's an approach that a lot of classroom teachers particularly use to teach rhythm um, in particular. But Vashti's using it with group and individual students um, in her studio setting and also with piano. And so we talk about the crossover and the relationship between teaching rhythm and how it can be taught using this method and also merging it onto the piano. I'm also really excited to let you know that we've put together a fantastic download for this episode and it's actually a cheat sheet, two page cheat sheet of Vashti's links of all the equipment that she tends to use in her studio and we've even gone to the trouble, or she's actually gone to the trouble, of linking up those instruments to where she buys them online. So this is going to be a fantastic resource. If you're not sure about where to start or what instruments to get, you can actually grab this cheat sheet from the show notes page and you can download it, print it out and actually go through, or actually don't even print it out, just click the links and go and buy what you need to get started. And you can just start really small with a couple of rhythm sticks and a couple of drums or a tambourine. You'll see what she does. Uh, she's got an amazing, uh, vibe and an amazing method and I think you're going to absolutely love it. So if you want to grab the download that's going to be at timtopham.com forward slash episode 45. That's episode in the number four five. And as usual, if you're enjoying these episodes, it would mean a heap to me if you could spend the five minutes it'll take to go and write a review on iTunes. If you've not done this before and you've listened to a few episodes, then please Take the time. Um, it really will. I really do appreciate it, and I do read all the reviews. To find out how to do that, it's really easy. But you can head to timtopham.com forward slash iTunes to get the uh, details about how to do that. Thank you very much also to the people who responded to my podcast survey. I've got uh, well over 100 or almost 200 responses there. So I've got lots of great ideas of what is going to help you the most in your teaching when it comes to these podcasts. I'm really glad, I must say, about how positive everyone was. I think we ended up with 4.7 stars out of five as the average. So that means a lot to me. I'm glad you're enjoying them. Uh, and I hope I can continue providing immense value for you. And I know that we're going to kick it off today with, uh, with this episode. Let me give you a really quick rundown about Vashti. She considers it her life's work to build community through the arts and to facilitate creative experiences for people of all ability levels. How about that for a goal in life? I love it. She has an extensive performance as well as teaching and directing background. She currently owns and operates Open Door Music Studio, where she teaches voice, piano, music together, big kids, and marimba and drum percussion ensemble. Vashti holds a Bachelor of Arts in Music from Mesa State Correlate College in Grand Junction, Colorado. I hope I said that right, guys. Correct me if I'm wrong. And a Master's of Music and vocal performance from Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington. She also has an Idaho Elementary Teaching Certificate with a K-12 Music Endorsement, an ORF Level 1 Certificate, World Music Drumming Level 1, and is a trained Music Together teacher. I sometimes, when it comes to music education, you know, pieces of paper like that are great, but when, when you check out the vibe that Vashti has going and the things that she's doing, it almost it really doesn't matter. She's just an incredibly talented teacher, creative, innovative, and inspirational, and I can't wait for you to meet her. Here is my interview with Vashti Somerville. So Vashti, I'm so glad you could come on the podcast today. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, I've been actually wanting to talk to people about or talk to someone about this idea of off 
for quite a while. Now, it sounds like the weirdest kind of thing to say and everything. Um, so firstly, what's with the weird name um, and what does Orf Schulwerk actually mean? Okay, so Orf Schulwerk literally means Orf schoolwork. So schoolwork in German is schoolwork. Okay. And Orf is Karl Orf, the composer who uh, he composed Carmina Burana is one of his most famous compositions. So some people might know that. So he's sort of the founder of the Orf schoolwork or schoolwork. Okay, cool. So what, what is the approach, the Orf approach, just in a nutshell? I know there's probably lots of depth you could go into, but as an overview, what's it all about? Okay. So you said the right word by calling it an approach. It's a philosophy. It is not a method. And there's a quote by Karl Orff that I think really sums up what it's about. And the quote goes, tell me, I forget. Show me, I remember. Involve me, I understand. So you, it's a very, very hands-on approach. And it, um, it starts with what children do best, and that's play. They instinctively imitate, experiment, reinvent, and improvise, and all these wonderful things when given the environment to do that. Um, you know, and I'm going to, I have to just pull up another set of notes here, Tim. I'm so sorry. Do no, it's fine. Start? Totally fine. I, look, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I had the pleasure of meeting um, one of uh, Vashti's friends at the MTNA, and she was talking about some of the stuff that you do in your studio. And we're actually going to have a look around your studio. You've got some are. students here ready to demonstrate some things. I cannot wait yes. for this. So if, if you're actually listening to this on iTunes, then I actually suggest you, you're welcome to keep listening, but make sure you jump online to uh, timtopham.com and find the actual show notes page for this episode because you're going to be wanting to watch the video for this episode for sure, right? Right. Okay. Found my other notes. <laughs> okay, cool. So an, a big tenet of the ORF approach is that music is inseparable from movement, dance, speech, and drama. They're just, they're all connected. So that's one, one big, big part of it. Um, so it's I've not like you take a kid and you sit them at the piano and then, and that's what they do for, and then they leave. It's, it's like piano is just one aspect My students, of the music. They're shaking their head like, we don't do that. <laughs> um, no, it is definitely very, you're using your whole body to deconstruct and reconstruct music and understand it from a lot of different approaches. And hopefully, you know, all learners are different. So hopefully one way will connect with each learner. And I do all group instruction. So that's especially important. Um, and it also, you know, a, a major belief, which I know a lot of your viewers and a lot of the people I've heard on your podcast also believe this, you know, the, the belief that all human beings are born musical, are born with musical aptitude and the ability to ha reach musical achievement. So that's another uh, big tenant of it. And that's sort of it in a nutshell. Mm, it sounds great. And so you, you made it a point of saying that it's not a method, it is an approach. What do you see as being the difference between those two things? Well, I think a method, I think of a method as something that's sort of a pre-packaged, here's a scope and sequence that take you from A to Z and these are the steps you follow where as an approach is, here's our philosophy and we value uh, your creativity as a teacher and you're going to sort of take who you are and use this philosophy and whatever inspires you to make it all work. Great. So it's not, it's not a pre-packaged curriculum that will get you from here to here. It's just not like that. Right. But there are, I assume, set activities or recommended music to play and things to do and instruments to use. Is that right? Yeah, there are. Um, a lot of the beginning music is very pattern-based and not complex in form um, and uses ostinato a lot. Do you know what that is? Um, so repeating patterns, I guess. Yeah, repeated yeah. musical patterns, which yeah. works really great in ensemble play. And I think what's unique, um, you know, this in the world of general music education in, in public schools, this is very familiar stuff. A lot of teachers use the ORF approach. And I started in, in a public school, and that's where I found out about this. I don't think a lot of people in private teaching world know much about this or have considered incorporating some of these instruments for ensemble play. And we'll, we, we'll take a tour and see all those in a while. Mm, mm, absolutely. Um, okay, so 
and yes, I, I'm, I'm familiar with that from my own uh, school that I teach at. They, they have the marimbas and they do an ORF approach, I think. Um, it certainly looks and sounds like what I understand to be ORF. I'll know about more about it at the end of this, I think. Um, well, I've seen, I've seen interviews with people. I can't remember their names, but the Forte School that you mm, interviewed. Yes, yes. People, and that's, uh, Paul, it's all yeah. very similar. You seem to interview a lot of people who are um, you, incorporating really non-traditional things in their studio which is great mm, it's so much fun isn't it it's so much so um do you only kind of teach with this approach now or do you still have the more traditional some more traditional piano lessons or perhaps for more advanced students they still have a more traditional approach or is it all this approach it's kind of all this approach my studio is very non-traditional i don't my kids do not do competitions or testing or anything like that and but I don't know what it would mean to say I'm just an ORF teacher. I think I'm a conglomerate of so many encounters with so many different creative people and experiences, and I just use whatever works, and that's constantly evolving for me. And I think to say I was a purist for ORF would really be contradictory to what it is either also, because it's just a philosophy that, you know, says all of us, you know, creativity begins from within each of us and it's just different for different people. So I don't think I could say that I just do one thing. Mm. And it's always no, changing. I, I, I get it and, and I'm totally with you. Like I, I like using, uh, that's why I like doing the podcast. I like using a bit of, I'll use a bit of this and I'll use a bit of that and take a bit of this and that's that's my approach, I guess. Well, you'd start to bore yourself after a while. If you didn't oh, totally. Change it up, Absolutely. Right? Right. Yeah, 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 100%. Um, so do you have to be trained to use this approach? So there aren't rules per se that say you have to have a training to start incorporating the philosophy. I mean, I, I, you can attend local workshops and we can talk about resources for that later mm. um, and just get some ideas to start bringing in or, you know, if you wanted to become a certified or be able to say you're certified in ORF, they have levels training. So you can go through three different levels. Those are usually summer trainings that are a couple of weeks long. And they're definitely, they dive into the pedagogy a lot more deeply in the history and, and that kind of stuff. But if you attend a local, I know Australia has a big association. And if you attend local workshops, I've been to workshops that have Dalcro specialists, Kodai specialists, you know, dance and movement specialists. So it's just a big mix of intersecting worlds. It's mm. really, it's really fun. Mm. Yeah, but you don't have to sort of be certified with a stamp to use these no. el elements. So teachers yeah. watching who like some of the things you show us today, it's like, yeah, go for it. You, yeah, do it. Yeah, I think yeah, it's a it's a philosophy. Yeah, no, it sounds great. So, does it kind of um, can can piano teachers use it in a piano studio if they don't have a whole lot of extra equipment and things? Can they use this approach on the keyboard? Definitely, and I still I don't know how many of your viewers teach group lessons. I think it it depends. You can do a lot more of this when you have a small group. Mm. My group size is average five. Um, and, you know, w w with some of the activities that we'll demonstrate with my lovely students sitting over here in a few minutes, I'll show you some very inexpensive little things that you can bring into your studio to like the whole enchilada when we take the tour, you'll see. And so I think you can, it just depends on who you are as a teacher and what you, what you want to do, what you invest and bring into your studio, but definitely a lot of it transfers to the keyboards. Great, great. I, I really loved, I found a, a quote on your website about how you teach piano, and it says, um, Open Door, which is the name of your studio, uses a unique and non-traditional method uh, to learn to play the piano. We approach it a lot like learning a new language. Students learn to play first and then begin reading and writing later. We acknowledge that music notation is only one way to communicate and learn music. So we work to develop oral and improvisationary skills and the ability to create original music in addition to being able to eventually read music. And uh, for me, this, this sits really well with my own approach. It's, it's, it's about, and this is the music learning theory of Dr. Gordon approach as well. Yes. Um, of you've got to, you should learn to speak the language, i.e. understand patterns and rhythm before you try and read it and then eventually write it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I love, there's a book, and I was, I've typed a page of resources out for you. I know you include a page oftentimes Fantastic. with your podcast. Mm. So I have a list of things. And one of the books that I put on there was um, 
Eric Bluestein or Bluestein, the ways children learn music, and he's sort of simplified Gordon's music learning theory. It's a pretty easy read compared to, you know, some of those things are weighty and harder to get yeah. through, but that book was really a great book for me and was really also in alignment with the ORF philosophy. Great. I'll enjoy reading that one too. Yeah. And so what ages and levels uh, does it suit? The ORF Anybody. approach? Anybody. I, I would use this, you know, there's a, a choir project that I have here in Boise called the Boise Intergenerational Choir. So we call it the acronym BIG, Big Choir for short. And it's, um, you know, I use these, this approach with the smallest of kids up to, you know, we have 90-year-olds in the choir who don't view themselves as musical. And this way of teaching works with everyone. Yeah, great. And what do you see is the biggest advantage of this approach? So absolutely just the freedom to create and build community through this ensemble play. I think that, you know, it's great sometimes to go and play your instrument by yourself and have some solitude and do that. But one of the greatest parts of being a musician is getting the opportunity to make music with other people. So, you know, that's to me the biggest benefit of it. Mm. And a which lot is of... also, sorry, I was gonna say, which is also why I love group lessons. But Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of, when I was interviewing people about group lessons, which was um, our, theme in March and we're doing some kind of summer camps in April um, a lot of them talked about the impact of commu the community forming that group lessons and group teaching has it brings a whole new dimension to this idea of piano education in particular oh it definitely does and a lot of times when we do jams at the end of a piano class parents or siblings who happen to be in the room will pick up an instrument and play and it's really really fun yeah yeah it's great and it adds that connection and kids want to come because they want to hang out with their friends as well as learn music yeah like there's heaps of benefits isn't there and they feel like they're in a band or you know it's yeah. just fun to jam and i was going to go back you 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 talked about delaying reading i wanted to say that you know reading is definitely a valuable tool that you need in your toolbox or your musical lego kit or whatever you have that you know you can always draw on to to generate music and, but i tell the kids you know if you take a piece of sheet music this there's not a lot of creativity that goes into reading that there's some expressive elements that you can add but being able to rearrange it restyle it reimagine it embellish it all those things that's what's really creative mm. um so it's i think those skills are equally as important as reading and you know another person that i just really am so grateful i had the opportunity to spend some time with him and at a conference in san diego and i think he recommended me for this is bradley sowash and i think all of his materials are also very much in alignment with this approach and the way he teaches improvisation is so amazing i want to be able to study with him myself mm. so there's a lot of people doing this really i think um, innovative work and the field needed it, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a movement. I think this, there feels like a groundswell, a bit of a movement moving in that direction now towards let's get more creative. Let's do some more improvising. It's not such a bizarre concept anymore. I don't think, I think this has only happened in the last five or so years. It, I do too. And my, you met my husband, Chad earlier. He's helping with the technical parts of, on our end. And he's also a musician. And we met in music college and we've spoke quite a bit about how you kind of feel like gypped a little bit from going to ping for all these music degrees and no one ever let you improvise or taught you anything about it in formal mm. training. That's how my training was. I don't know about yours. Yeah. So I'm trying to reinvent myself and create a different environment in the studio for my students. And it's hard when you didn't grow up doing it that way. It's, mm, it's a it different, is. you know, we were definitely in a box, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 100%. No, uh, in music education over here is the same as I think it is in, in the States in many ways. Yeah. It's very traditional. Um, and and my, my worry is that, you know, these students end up being incredible performers. They finish university, um, but there's no performing jobs out there. It's, it's, not, right. it's, not, it's not a role that you can do now. So what, are we, what skills are we giving them that are actually going to be useful to them in the future? I, I, that's what I would question. And I think also this approach um, 
really leads them to be lifelong music makers for the joy of it, not necessarily because they want to be on a competition track or, you know, just they want to be able to make music with people in their living room for their life. Makes, makes sense to me, Vashti. Yeah. <laughs> I love that um, concept. Reading is just one tool in your toolkit. I think it's a great yes. approach. All right. I can't wait to see some. We've got to get get into action. So what would you I like to do? I know they're going to fall asleep. Should we get oh, them no. up and do some stuff? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Totally. So this could be a little shaky moving the um, computer around, but Chad's going to do his best. Cool. So how about should we – why don't I start with some of the gross motor rhythm warm-ups that we do that I think front load students for – not only reading, but just great expressive playing later. Should we just start with a few of those? Perfect. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Girls. Well, you better introduce, introduce your girls because they, oh, let's they, put them up here. they okay, won't come like up here, before. Come up here. Okay. So this is Cece. Hey, Cece. Hi, Cece. And her big sister, Livy, who agreed to come in and help today. Hi, Livy. And then this is Amelia. Hey, Amelia. Right. And these, these, all three of them are in piano classes, and then these two are also voice students of mine. So Brilliant. Thanks so much, girls, for helping out. I can't wait to see what we're going to do. Okay. Let's so um, let me grab. So, Tim, I'm, I'm not close, as close to the microphone, so you have to let me know. No, I can hear um, you perfectly. It's all good. Okay. So these, I have these are finger symbols. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one of the really beginning activities, and girls, let's put you on the carpet up there. Um, I cut, let's see if we can see them all. Yep. There we go. Yep. So I play this little thing called how many sounds in a beat or how many beats in a sound. So I just get them listening. Um, you know, I might even actually, Chad, can you keep a beat on a drum for me? Because he can't, I don't think they can hear my foot stomp. So Chad's going to get a beat going. Okay, girls, so you're going to tell me how many sounds in each beat. Okay. Two. Okay. Good, okay. Did that kind of make good sense, Tim? Mm -hmm. So then you say, when you want to do notes of longer dur duration, you know how many beats and a sound. So we'll get the beat going again, Chad. Okay. How many? How many beats are, is this sound covering? Two, two, two. Three. One, two, three. I, yeah, I tricked you with that. So you can do, you know, dotted halves, half notes, quarter, or whole notes that way, even before you label it that. So that's kind of a really, I love these finger symbols for that reason. So the next step I would do with that is to, if they sit on the floor, can you see them? Can yes. you guys sit? Okay. Out of interest, so, Vashti, why don't you um, go with clapping or tapping? Why, why do you find the instrument is a good idea? For, with that, just for them to start to orally figure out, you know, beat related to sounds in a beat or how many beats a sound takes. Just those finger symbols having both, having that sustain. Oh yeah, sure, yeah. On those, right? Because mm. when you're clapping, you can't really clap a sustained note. You can um, demonstrate it maybe by a motion, but it's just not the same mm. as that sustain with that. So the second step with this is I would have the girls, they would get the beat, patting the beat on their now, verbally, they're just going to use syllables like bum, 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 or dee, 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 dee. And I want you guys to fit one sound in a beat. Here we go. Bum, bum, bum. All together, bum, 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 bum. Change to two. Here we go. Bum, 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 Change to four. Here we go. Bum, 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 b
So, you know, I'll classify things as woods, metals, skins, or shakers. Skins being drums. Mm -hmm. And you want them to choose something, have diff different timbres. And I'll show you what we do now. So, why don't um, you get on the box drum. Cece, why don't you get the temple blocks that are on top of that thing called rock. And Liddy, for now, you do shakers, and then we're going to trade this up, okay? Okay, can you still see them, Tim? Okay, so I have the metal, Livy has shakers, Cece has wood, and she's got the cajon. The, it's not really a skin, it's a little different kind of a sound, but we'll go with that. So I'm going to keep a beat, and you guys are going to fit one sound in a beat. Here we go. Everybody, one, snatch, ready. Change to two. You're going to do the single sounds. You're doing the twos. So notice I'm not labeling them. These guys read and they they know now, but I'm not labeling things as quarter notes, eighth notes, anything. Now it's just something that they can relate to an experience. Mm -hmm. And Livy, you're going to be the fours, so alternating one, two, three, four. Okay. So let's try it. And you're the twos, right? And you're the ones. All right. Here we go. One, two, three, four. So it's like having your own drum kit, like making up a drum kit beat. Yeah, yeah. it's like a drum school. And then I might, I would probably rotate that around and, you know, they would each get to experience the feeling of, of um, doing the ones, the twos, or the fours. I don't, you know, I don't start with triplets right away, but the, later they'll experience that. And we don't ever do like triplets against that, like in the beginning, yeah. doing the three against two is pretty hard for them. But you could hear by them having a different timbre, it did give it that cool drum circle feel and you could really hear the difference, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, That's so, great. yeah, so, you know, we started with just the finger cymbals, transferred that to them doing a little body percussion with speech, so they felt it within their body, and then transferred it to the instruments. Now, you could... You know, a teacher could play a chord progression and they could just do um, like a single note on the keyboard against this. And you could transfer, you know, singles, doubles or fours to mm -hmm. a keyboard with a single note or with maybe, you know, like a five note scale. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. I like that as an idea. Particularly, I mean, instead of sort of, okay, clap clap along with me, uh, instead of doing that, you could play, yeah, play a chord progression and, okay, you're going to play on beat one and then you're going to play two notes per beat. Great idea. Yeah, exactly. And that gets them familiar with these instruments. And a lot of times down the road, I'll let them create ostinatos. So if they're listening to another student in class play a piano piece, they're not just sitting there spacing out. They're actively participating by adding a percussion part of yeah. some, yeah. something. So that works really well. So that's um, kind of how, what I call how many sounds in a beat, how many beats in a sound evolves over several weeks. Mm, it's great. Um, okay, so want me to go on to another one? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so as you notice, so, I mean, you can buy things like maracas and shakers and sticks for fairly inexpensive, and we'll put that on a resource sheet. Now, here's another thing I bet most piano teachers don't have in their studio, racquetballs. Uh, no. Okay, <laughs> so get your racquetball, girls. Okay. All right. So, stand with this. I'll get a hand drum, and I might use a mallet or just, you know, use my hand. This is really an exercise that is helping them keep track of where they are in a measure. But I'm not even calling it a measure right now. I'm, I'll tell them I'm either doing beats in cycles of three or four. So they're getting um, to understand a duple feel and a triple, triple feel. Yeah. Okay. So, which the triple one's really hard. It's, it's lopsided. But they don't have a, a lot of the pop music they listen to. None of it's mm. very little of is in uh, triple feel. Mm, true. Okay. So we are going to start with cycles of four. 
I get four beats all to myself, and then you get to join bouncing your racquetball only on beat one, okay? And you want to sound like one person dropping one ball. That's how accurate you want to be. So you have to adjust your distance or your force if you're off. And the other thing that this leads to is it prepares them for anacrusis or pickup, like uh, a preparatory right. beat. Like we all, right, yeah. right, okay. Okay, so I get four beats alone, you're on beat, um, you're on beat one. Add beat three with it. Hold. This time, beat three only. I get four all by myself, and then your cycle starts. So you have to wait a lot of counts. Hold. Beat two. Chad on the spot. Chad's gonna go to the piano and play some kind of blues thing. Two, three, four. Like a left hand, open, close, open. Okay, all right, good. So I went <laughs> Very cool. to the and if we're working on 12 bar blues, they might play some kind of what, something in their repertoire while the kids are playing the racquetballs. And then we've kind of done a found sound percussion fun thing too. Yeah. But the point of that is keep track, keeping track of where you are in a measure and really learning about preparation or anacrusis pickup. Really important. That, that was fantastic. Yeah. And, and I, of course, course, the girls here are all pros at it. I'm sure I, I know anyway. So obviously this would, you know, there would be balls on the floor and people missing beats. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You girls and are too good. They're really good at it, right? Um, and you know, and then I do it in three. And when we're in three, I usually just have them uh, bounce on beat one or beat three. And if you want to have them do beat one and three, I usually divide the group in two. And half will be beat one, half will be beat three. It's too hard to do that three, three one. Three one. Yeah. 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 So, but I think it's really important to do triple meter activities whenever you can also. Yeah, yeah. what a great little idea. I mean, any of us can use that tomorrow. That, that's a cool yeah. idea. Yeah. And that's like what I was thinking with this is to give teachers something they can put in their, mm. in their studios right away. So. And can one of the girls bring up the ball to the camera so we can all yeah. look at one? The plain racquetball. Look at them. So it's quite, is it quite spongy? Squeeze them, girl. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That's great. Thanks, girls. Hmm. Okay, so I have one more gross motor warm up that mm -hmm. um, we can do, and this one it deals with um, really internalizing uh, phrase length, and and then it leads really into freeing yourself up for um, improvisation. So, do you want me to continue? Yeah, we let's do, do it. Time? Okay. Yep. So, this is question answer. Okay, and this is how this starts. So a very uh, or thing to do is you start with speech and then you transfer, transfer it to body percussion and then transfer it to an instrument. And I'll use this, you probably do this in your studio too, tricky passage, you need to be able to sing it or say it. If you can't sing it or say it, you can't play it, mm -hmm. right? Or audiate it. Do you know the term audiation, sure. right? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Thinking that's just, yeah. And, you know, if I have a group, I have a piano lab in the back, I'll show you, you know, if they're playing a piece and it maybe has a little syncopation in it and the group is just not aligned, then I make them sing it while they're doing it. And if they're not singing it out loud, I say, you better be singing it in your head and it cleans it up every time. Cool. So this, um, I kind of got off on that, but we'll, no, we'll no, no, try that's it. great. That's great. <laughs> so this is question and answer. And I always start out with really simple, I just say, What's your name? So I want you and you three to tell me how many beats that question takes up. What's your name? Two beats. Huh? 
two beats. So your answer can be two beats, okay? So we'll start with Amelia. She could say, hers, hers is, um, let's start with Libby. <laughs> Amelia's has a little pickup in it. So Libby, or my name is Libby. Ah, uh, yeah, cool. She could say, um, her, what's your middle name, Libby? Livy Lou, or I don't want to use her last name online. So I'll use no, mine. No, no, yeah, sure. If her last name was Somerville. She could say Livy Somerville. So there's a lot of ways, and the, you know, if you turned any of those speech patterns into a rhythm on an instrument, they would be cool, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm just gonna start by speaking, and I'll start with you. What's your name? Mm -hmm. Talk loud. What's your name? Mm -hmm. What's your name? Okay, did you hear? Yeah, that was cool, yeah, yeah. So now, once again, this process would unfold over a lot of weeks. Now I'm gonna say, we're gonna do the same. Do you like how you did it? Do you wanna change it? You wanna change it? Okay, one more chance, ready? What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? My name's Amelia. So they did them the same. Yeah. Now this, <laughs> say it while you clap it. So you're clapping all the syllables, essentially. What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? My name's Amelia. Okay, you picked a tricky one, right? <laughs> now I'm going to say audiate what you did while you clap it. So the sound goes in your head, the words go in your head now. We're turning off the voice. All right, ready? Okay, mm. so you have a circle and you keep that going. Then you take it one step further and you do question, answer, question, echo. And I would ask the question, Libby gives the answer. I ask the question again, they have to echo what Libby did. So they have to retain whatever her pattern was while I'm asking the question again. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense? Yep. So it, just do this, you just for now, okay? Okay, ready? Now, they really understand what a two-beat phrase is, the way, you know, with my, the beat I was just keeping. They get that. So now, they're just going to improvise two beats, okay? okay. So I yeah. just say something else, okay? That, right? Yeah, we the 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 um, Skype just decided to go a bit funny on those, but we get get the idea. So you get the idea. Yeah, yeah. Now the way you could then take that to the piano immediately, and I'll just do a really quick thing. Um, so you we could do uh, just question answer over the twelve bar blues using just C as their um, improv the note they're going to improvise on. So for just a minute, how about a million CC? Find a C here, and you'll probably just be able to hear it, maybe not see it. C C. Okay, so you're gonna ask the question, she's gonna do the answer. And it's um so ready, yeah, ready, set, just a C note, go. Ask another. like they were clapping but they're doing it on one note and it starts to become a little more musical and it. then you could add more notes but that's just kind of the process for how that activity extends and then I, I really like it let me um just pause for one second i think we've lost my webcam on on the recording i'm just going to turn off my camera and turn it back on again so don't don't freak out when i disappear <laughs> um but I, I uh i just just also can you still hear me 
I can still hear you. Yeah. Um, I just also wanted to say, there we go. I think I'm back now. Um, that I really love that concept of um, you speak it, speak it first, speak the rhythm yeah. and, and use words because that's easy. And like the name one, yes. I reckon that's great. Then audio it. So think, think what you're saying while you're clapping it yeah. and then take it to the instrument. Brilliant. I think that's something we can all use. I'm going to use it today yeah. or this week. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> good. All right. Um, now, have you got, have you got some other, other bits and pieces? Sure. So that, I guess, um, was those were kind of rhythm, gross motor warm ups that are just fun. And like I said, then front load them very effectively for reading because they're really successful later when you connect a lot of what we just did to um, written representation. They get it like that because they've had all those experiences. And this kind of relates to who was the gentleman you had on? Paul Harris. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The simultaneous learning. Uh huh. It's very similar to that. I loved that podcast and I love that book. So it's it's a, it's similar, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah. The the concept of giving upskilling before you actually start learning a yeah. piece or whatever. Yeah, upskilling. Totally. That's a new word. Yeah. I like that. So. <laughs> um. So I could. Well, may, maybe now is a good time to actually do a studio tour. Yes, I'd love to see it because I've, I've heard about some particularly interesting yeah. things you've got here. Everyone's talking about. We've got it. Well, we've how got about it. this? We'll save the we'll save the most interesting one for very last, and then we'll actually get the girls on some of these. We'll start. Um, we'll walk back. There's a piano lab. The lighting is not so good. I had a little lighting issue this week, but you'll That's get okay. the idea. It's just a it's a piano lab. Okay, so yeah. go. We're follow me. Good steady cam have- chat. I'm impressed. Right? <laughs> Use your car. You should. Uh, drop in the mic. <laughs> okay. All right. Wow, this is um, this is a, a, a proper. Uh, did you build this this room, or is it part of your house, or? Oh no, I I rent a commercial space. I'm. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm downtown where I live, and I rent a commercial space, so I don't know. Yeah, we can see. Yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, so, so there's two, four, five. Five. There's five. Yeah. In mm-hmm. here. Okay. This is kind of tricky on Skype. Um, okay, so now we're gonna go. We're walking back through what is my office back to the main room here. This is great. This is why I love uh, video podcasts. We can actually explore. Okay. So. Um, big part of ORF, um, I'm going to tell you the a lot of times it is associated, I can't see you, hello, with, uh, with <laughs> there, I'm going to do that, is that better? That's better. Um, it's associated with xylophones, metallophones, glockenspiels, in, in a general music setting, you know, the, they became kind of an outgrowth of ORF's work, and you know, they're a gross motor with mallets, and when so some of the instruments that were developed, the bars were removable. Mm-hmm. And hear them referred to as barred instruments because they have bars. Yeah. The reason for that, they all come in like a C diatonic scale, but they come with B flats and F sharps so that you can play and do improvisation in a pentatonic in C, F, and G. So that right. was the reason. For my studio, because this is not a general music classroom, I've chosen chromatic marimbas. They do not have removable bars. So mm-hmm. here's... Can, we can can you kind of see that Tim mm-hmm. okay so really easy for students to transfer piano patterns to these because it's you know it's like a piano keyboard with you know your um, flats and sharps up there looks the same right mm-hmm but I've heard that the because the ORF approach uses uh, sticks, it's more of a gross motor skill, so people can improvise. I think uh, Paul from uh, Forte was talking. We were talking about this on a mastermind yesterday with my community. Um, the you know to to get away from kids having to use the right finger shape and all this kind of stuff on the piano when they improvise early on, they can just use the right notes. Yes. Yeah. Totally. It's using much sticks. Different. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I have. Um, This is a three octave chromatic. I have two of these and then I have a four octave one. So they're just kind of along the wall here. Oh yeah, yep. And then um, of course over here we have a shelf with all kinds of those small percussion instruments, the egg shakers, sticks, all that stuff. These are tubanos and they're just really sturdy drums that work um, in a setting where they take a lot of use. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the the surprises. Okay, so this is <laughs> it's huge. this is a well, this is a small 
to this one right here. I don't know if we can see where we are. Yep. This is a baritone. And uh, what? One, sorry, what's it called? It's a baritone marimba. Ah, oh, right. More in the like the African style marimbas, so it's just a C scale. Um, and we have a friend that we approached. He has a woodworking shop, and we actually got this wood from a tree that was dying um, in the neighborhood. And oh, wow. You know, we made this. His brother happens to be a music physicist, too, because there was a lot of music physics that went into that. But then this one wasn't low enough. So we built <laughs> this guy. And I'm going to actually, why don't you girls climb up there? All three of you. This is, this is what I've heard about. <laughs> okay, so Livy wants me to tell you what we call it. We refer to that as Marimbasaurus Rex. <laughs> Marimbasaurus is giant. You see that they had to step up on a step to get up there. And, yeah, if you um, happen to be listening to this episode, you need to jump on the video now to see this size of this marimba. Yeah, you guys have to <laughs> so you can kind oh, of hear that it. that is cool. And, I mean, this is me in front of it. It's huge. It's so tall. Yeah. So it's really, really fun. And we'll use it quite a bit um, for jams. We'll let students pick out bass parts when it works with the key on there. But it's really fun. That's got a, such a beautiful resonance, hasn't it? Yeah, it's really fun. <laughs> um, so we can, I can demonstrate, like we can demonstrate a little jam with these if you want. Yeah, that'd be cool. We, we'll kind okay. of, we, we'll need to start wrapping up soon, but I think that's a great way to kind of finish off. Demonstrate a jam and then we'll, you and I can wrap up. And that's we'll a great see. idea. Yeah. Okay. How about we'll just do a blues jam. That's really fun. Um, they love that and it's, really great for improvising. So why don't, how about Cece, why don't you start out up there and you're going to do the 12 bar blues pattern, C, 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 F, F, C, C, right? And then Libby is going to do something that Bradley Sowash taught me. Let me get it. Um, she's going to play, we have all these nice instruments, but she's going to play a box. Can you see the box? <laughs> yep. And this was from Bradley Sowash, and he, you know, when you're doing a swing rhythm, he said to think of the words cheese doctor. So it's that transfer again to cheese doctor, cheese doctor, and he, you know, remember that? Okay, and then Amelia, she will, she knows her blues, the minor blues scale. So she'll do that, and I'll go ahead and play like a bass part on the piano. Um, and if we had more kids, I wouldn't play any of it. They mm -hmm. would do it all. Okay. sorts of modes and um, keys and it's re it's really fun so that's gives you an idea and what could be less expensive than an old cardboard box right yeah. I know you get these <laughs> no nice excuses. instruments and they fight over the box <laughs> <laughs> oh that was great thank you so much to the girls get you better get them up on camera again Come here, girls. <clears throat> <sighs> aren't they lovely thank they you are. so much take a bow <laughs> thank you so much really really good great work thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if that kind of gave you an overview, a little taste Ab of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just kind of in, in summary, because we're obviously there's um, a mainly piano teaching audience. Have you got just like a couple of other tiny little things that you know work really well um, in the, like on the keyboard? Um, yeah. I mean, I would just say just doing that transfer always, like what we talked about, speaking, audiating, you know, or, or speaking and playing it, always doing that, it mm -hmm. works great. Use it, we use a lot of singing in my studio. Um, and, you know, cost, getting them to jam, even if you just have one piano, we always get, you've done this, you know, you get several hands on that piano, invest in some just very basic small instruments and make sure 
that everyone is engaged or involve a parent or even if you're it's just you're doing a private lesson they're getting that experience of having to keep a rhythm mm. go on that piano because there's someone doing a per, you know a percussion part with them so they can't they've really got to think of flow and expression and playing through something and they it can take away some of the pauses so that's yeah i think it's yep. a really important part uh, it's one of the reasons why i like just the simple 12 bar blues uh getting the kids not only to to do the improvising with some kind of blues scale but also to do the chords and keep the steady beat while i improvise yes. and try and throw them off just to see if they can keep that beat. i think it's really really important but I think probably the big thing that I've gained from this is just a real reminder, and I need to do it more, of the need to sing and hear and speak things before you take them to the instrument or to, to clapping or tapping. I think I'm and gonna, just, that's what I'm yeah, going to work on. Feel them in your body. Yeah. Getting the kids up and moving and doing a lot of work away from the piano bench to avoid just practicing mistakes over and over at the piano. If you do this front loading, then a lot of times they can go and play something pretty much perfect the first time. But if you're just, here's this piece of paper, sit down, we're going to read this, count this, it's not as successful. Yeah, yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense, Vashti. Thank you so much for this. It has been so much fun. I've really enjoyed it. I know people are going to love watching it and seeing your energy and all your ideas. Now, you mentioned that you've, you've got together a resource for us. So can you just tell us what that um, includes for teachers? Sure. I'll send, it'll have links to the ORF associations for the U.S., Australia, Canada, and the U.K. And I'm sure that people in other countries could, could find one in their country as well. And there you can learn more about the history of ORF, find out about local trainings and workshops, as well as the levels trainings. Um, I'll include a world music drumming link, which that's another really valuable training where you get to go and learn to work with drumming circles, which I think that skill is works well in a piano studio setting later. Yeah. Um, and then I will include a list of so, sort of from the least expensive investment up to, you know, if you decided that you wanted bigger instruments in your piano studio, just a list of products that I recommend that I've tried, um, you know, and with the different timbres, mm. you know, a collection of woods, metals, skin shakers, that kind of thing. Right. And my favorite um, U.S. music ed kind of supply place is West Music. And I, I'll put a link and that's all the products I've linked go through there pretty much. And yep. so, but for people in Australia, I wouldn't know that's what okay. That's okay. You well, can get an idea. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, that is, and then I that's I brilliant. A, I listed a couple books on there too. So yep. I'll just get that email to you. Great, great. All right. And I'll have the details. Uh, it'll be on the show notes page for today's episode. Um, and where can people find out more about you and your studio? Um, my website is opendoormusicstudio.com. Great. And there's a lot of your philosophies just jotted down there in small little bits, which I found. So really great to read. I'd encourage anyone to go there, see what you're all about. Um, and if people have some questions, are you happy for me to shoot them through to you if they leave them on the show notes page? Sure. Yeah, yeah no problem. That would be great. Vashti, okay. it has been so awesome. I'm, I'm sorry we couldn't catch up at MTNA, but next next time I'm over in the States, right. well, I'll have to yes. have to come to Idaho, I guess. Oh, good place. <laughs> come it. visit. That's it. All right. Thanks again. And we'll speak to you again soon. Thank you, Tim. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. If the idea of a piano teacher's community where you get to access the best educational resources, rub shoulders with expert teachers from around the world, and have immediate access to feedback for any of your questions, then Inner Circle membership is for you. The Inner Circle is my private community of piano teachers from across the globe who share a commitment to creating and delivering the most inspiring, modern, and progressive learning experiences for their students. Membership is now open, so head to timtopham.com forward slash community to find out more and get involved today. I can't wait to see you on the inside.